Joining us today is Kim Davis, who is editorial director of MarTech Today. Previously, he served as editor-in-chief of DMN, uh, where he spent time not only writing and curating content, attending, covering, and speaking at countless uh, conferences and events, and running social efforts, but also recorded more than 100 podcasts with under other industry thought leaders uh, while he was there. So, wow. Um, Kim has been covering enterprise software for more than 10 years, and in his prior journalistic life, he covered culture and food for the New York Times hyperlocal site, The Local East Village, which I think is so fun and cool. So welcome, Kim. Thanks for being here today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's always great to see you, Ginger. I can't believe I actually did all the things you just said, but I guess it's who I am not. <laughs> well, so for all of those, those of you out joining us today, Kim and I actually worked together for a while at DMN, uh, which was really fun. And then, of course, we continue to run into each other everywhere, you know, all the big events and such. So, um, you know, it's so great to see him now in this new role and uh, to have him here today. Um, so, Kim, as you know, the marketing technology landscape has expanded to more than 8,000 solutions according to you know, the latest count by Scott Brinker. Um, and we're experiencing monumental shifts in business strategy, customer expectations, and of course, the ever-present data privacy issues. With all that, marketers' plates are overflowing but not every technology trend related to these issues is worth latching onto. So what do you see as say the two or three notable MarTech trends that marketers should watch and, and why? And we'll save the most important one for later because you know, we wanna keep the anticipation high, kind of like when you're waiting for the Heinz ketchup to hit your burger. Okay, well I hope that won't be a disappointment in that case. <laughs> I I started out with a couple which seemed to me to be very important. Then I did add a third one, and it relates to some of the things you've just been talking about. This week, I received my invitation, which I do get each year, to Inbound, the HubSpot conference in September. And I immediately thought, oh, late September in Boston. But of course, no, no, no. It's virtual inbound. It's inbound online. And certainly one trend which I think we're all aware of, especially those of us who used to be on the conference circuit, is virtual conferences. I am not even going to attempt to predict whether this is a trend which will continue just for another six months or for another 18 months or even longer. Um, I was talking to somebody just the other day, um, runs a, an education tech platform, and she was saying, we have to start to think lectures, having a huge number of people in a big room all at one time, is it necessary, does it make sense? And while I can see huge incentives for something like Dreamforce or the, the big Adobe and Oracle conferences to continue, because after all, they do drive revenue, um, I think a lot of people are going to start over from scratch and rethink live events. How necessary are they? What's the ROI on them? And can we drive similar interest, revenue, and conversions or, or lead generation with virtual events? Uh, and that, that is going to be one trend, I think, over the next year. Of course, who knows, maybe a year from now, everything will be completely normal again and we'll forget all about it, but I somehow doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's number three. N number two is rather more serious um, in some ways, especially. Let me start with B2B marketing. What we've seen over the last, I guess, five or six months now is a real transformation of the landscape, especially in B2B marketing. For a minority of vendors, especially those who support remote working, and I might allude to the platform we're using, Zoom, there's been huge interest and an overabundance of leads, lots of opportunities, and their challenge has been handling that huge demand. I suspect from majority of B2B vendors, it's been the opposite. There's been a famine when it comes to leads. Uh, in, if you're working in some spaces, you are, obviously you've hit some kind of crisis. If you're in hospitality or travel, that's very serious. But everyone is, is looking for leads. And I think in both cases, whether it's an overabundance or a famine, it suggests 
doubling down on your ABM strategy because you really are going, going to want to priorita prioritize accounts, identify the accounts which are really important to you. And the other thing it's going to do is to, and I think this is where it's relevant to B2C as well, it's going to drive a rethink of your approach to your marketing tech stack. Because I think looking back, we were in this great period where you could have the, you could just download something for the team, give it a try, see how it worked out. You could experiment, you see a new tool, let's, let's play with that and see if, it, if it's right for us. I think now people are focused much more on the vital, the critical part of the stack, what some people have called a wartime. MarTech stack. And I saw some research from Topo, the analysts, and they're saying that these days MarTech tools have to be mission critical, able to be quickly adopted, because who knows where you're going to be six months from now, if you've got a six month implementation. They've got to be high impact and they've got to be versatile. So that's my second trend towards uh, a lean, wartime tech stack rather than the peacetime, let's experiment with everything approach. <laughs> You know, that's, it's, it's interesting that you say that about the MarTech stack, because just, um, just today, Scott Brinker, his email, um, so he wrote the article yesterday, but his email today was referring to an article that he wrote yesterday on um, marketing technology and kind of looking at the long tail of, of all the small companies, right, the really, really niche point solutions and how um, sometimes you, you need to take a look at those and they're great. And other times it's just kind of like you said, like it's, it's a little bit of, of overkill. And he had this great, um, he drew a map of, well, he showed a map of, of the UK coastline as an example. So um, if you measure it one way, like kind of more, outer edges, it's, you know, whatever it is, I'm just going to make up a number, like 10,000 miles or whatever. But if you, if you start going in to all the inlets of the water edges, actual water's edges, all of a sudden, you know, it's whatever, 12,500 miles. You know, I mean, obviously like, the numbers are really off, but like you see it's, it's all in how you look at things. And the story was so interesting. It's like, sometimes you need to go into the alcoves, but a lot of times, it's overkill. So it's really considering like, what's your strategy and where do you need to go? Uh, you know, when do you need to go deep and when do you need to, to use that wartime approach, right? Yeah, no, I, I love Scott, but that's one thing we tended to disagree on is the importance of that long tail because the difference between software as a service and other kinds of industries is you don't need a warehouse or a distribution chain to sell software. You just have to, put it up in the cloud and wait for people to download it. So a an awful lot of those 8,000 companies, the ones towards the longer end of the tail, it's really not a big business. It's somebody with a nifty bit of software they can sell you. Yeah. So now let's look at the other side because, you know, in looking at that long tail, um, a lot of those, those technologies, especially when they're related to social, um, and in some cases mobile, can really be the distracting shiny object. And you often, like you said, you, you want to try them because you don't want to miss a good opportunity, but they can be distracting if they don't fit into your strategy at all, right? So with that in mind, what MarTech trends are you seeing that are really more hype than substance? Okay. Well, the first one I've got might be a controversial one, and I willingly admit I may be wrong about it. Um, personalization, by which I mean, I don't mean segmentation, I mean, I mean real one-to-one -one personalization. And Gartner, in fact, are predicting that by, look at my notes, 2025, 80% of marketers will have given up on that kind of personalization which is a bit shocking for those 8,000 vendors because so many of them make personalization really one of their key selling points. You can at last meet your customer one-to-one. -one. Right. The problem I see with personalization is that it goes a long way, but it doesn't quite reach its goal. Um, give you an example. 
and I'm sure you'll have these experiences. You go online, uh, back in the days when we used to travel, you'd need a hotel in Chicago for the last week of August. You'd search the usual websites, you find your hotel and you book it. You'd then be pursued on all your different channels and devices by ads offering you a hotel in the same place at the same time. Now, in a sense, that shows how great personalization is. They know who I am. They found me. They've tracked my behavior. They recognize me then on a completely different channel. I've put my hotel on a you know, website I found on Google. They find me on Instagram. They find me everywhere I am. And they know what I was interested in, but they're incapable right. of making me a relevant offer. And I see that again and again. The most extraordinary example was I bought a really outdated piece of equipment, a cassette player, because I had some cassettes and I wanted to play them. And I was pursued for a month by ads for more cassette players. How many cassette players does <laughs> one person possibly need? So, yeah, uh, are we going to abandon personalization? Not completely. But after several years of looking at this, I'm beginning to have a little bit of skepticism about so many vendors, including this whole wave of customer data platforms, who tell you they can find your customer, they can resolve their identity, they can meet them where they are. Yes, they can, but what are they bringing them? Right. Interesting. I, I uh, had a conversation recently about this topic, and the, um, the person was talking about humanization instead of personalization. So using the data to take to have a more human interaction with your consumers, um, not just, you know, stalking them online kind of thing. Yes, and there's, um, I'll mention one vendor, I try not to mention vendors, this interesting example, Pega, uh, Pega Systems as it used to be, they have uh, artificial intelligence with an empathy control. You can actually set your empathy control so you can, if you're on a crunch and you need to sell stuff, you can dial the empathy down and just blast your customers. But if you want to go in the direction you're talking about, you can push the empathy up and give them more human, more kind of rich, supportive messaging. Huh, interesting. It's, it's interesting how, how what, what personalization is has, has evolved and how the the cool and creepy line has shifted over over time. You know, I, I remember years ago, um, the CEO of Harris at the time, Gary Loveman, said at a conference that um, before they did something using customer data, they would ask themselves, "What would my grandma think of this? Ah. Like, would it pass the grandma test?" You know. <laughs> And now the, the grandma test is long gone. <laughs> yeah, I think we've become almost immunized. We, we know, unless we take steps to prevent it, we, we know companies know where we are and what we're doing. Yeah. So, um, okay, so we've got a question on this. So we may be forced out of, it's a little bit long, so bear with me as I read it. We may be forced out of personalization as decisions in Mountain View and Cupertino, never mind Sacramento, Sacramento and Brussels, drive relevant data out of the ad ecosystem that uh, Big Digital and Big Brother doesn't control. Revenge, oh, revenge of the technologists. <laughs> <laughs> so not really a question, more of a statement, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting. What's your take? Well, I think there's two sides to that. Uh, certainly the kind of regulation we can reasonably anticipate is going to make it harder and harder to enrich your customer profiles with third party data. The other side of that coin, it drives you back to your first party data. And the more you lean on that, probably the more true a picture of your customer you've got. So I could argue that from either direction. So wait, so Kim, you froze on that for me a little bit. I'm not sure if I, everyone else heard, but um, could you just repeat like the second half of that answer? Yeah, just, just for the nutshell, while it may be more difficult to enrich your profiles, your customer profiles with third party data, if it leads you to double down on your first party data, you may be getting 
a more precise and accurate picture of your customer anyway, so I can see both sides. Yeah, absolutely. I remember years ago, um, Don Peppers and Martha Rogers used to talk about how with first party data, it's one of the great things about it is that it gives you a unique view of your customer, of customers that no one else has because they, they don't have the same exact mix of data. They may know about your customers, but they don't know everything that you know. So even if they have a view of them, they'll have a completely different view. And you probably have an advantage by the view that you have because you should know, you know that, that more information, that first, that first party insight. Um, so as we talked about with Scott Brinker, the MarTech landscape is, you know, sprawling 800 or so products. Um, I feel like it's overwhelming when you think of it as, as a whole, uh, but not every company, like you talked about earlier, right? Not every company needs every type of solution. You know, it, even if you break those 8,000 products into various categories, you may not need even every category for your business. So how can marketers best match key trends with the right technologies for their strategic priorities? Okay, well, I think I may just, as the footnote, um, mention Scott Brinker's landscape. I would recommend people go and take a look at MarTech Tribe, martechtribe.com, where there's a guy in Holland who has taken a, very similar landscape and is made interactive. And if you thought it was impossible to see all the things on Scott's landscape, why do you see them all interlinking around the kind of 3D visualization? That's why I'm um, But I come back to your question. I will say, and I think. A lot of people would say this. Just where I froze? Did I freeze on you? You're a little frozen again. So yeah, if so, if you could just. Ginger, I think I just froze on you again. Yeah, you, you froze. Again. You you froze again. Hi. <laughs> So you seem to be back with us. So whenever, whenever you want to tell us about that website again, it would be great. Okay, I'm not seeing you right now, but uh, we can press on. Um, yeah, it's just mentioning a website I saw this morning, martechtribe.com, where uh, a guy has taken a landscape very, very similar to Scott's, but he's made it interactive, which means uh, you not only have the dizzying number of vendors, but you have all these interconnections between them, the kind of 3D visualization, and, and it's, it's absolutely mind blowing. But to come back to your question um, about technology and, and, and trends, yeah, it can be overwhelming, but I think the point is you don't start with technology. Never start with the technology. You need to start with your business aims. You've got to think about what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve more uh, at the top of your funnel, more attention, more awareness. Are you trying to guide customers uh, through the funnel, uh, stage by stage? Are you looking at retention? That's an enormous topic these days because once you've acquired a customer, the hope is they'll continue spending with you and that may, may be a better value than going out and spending on acquiring new customers. So what do you want to do? have a plan, have all the departments or teams signing off on the plan, that's also quite important. Then the next step is you still don't go out and start buying bits of technology off the shelf because almost certainly you've already got technology. Uh, you, could have, you could have tools which you're not using, you could have duplicative tools. It's, you really need to audit what you've got. So once you've got those two things, agreement on business objectives and a plan on how to achieve them, and a thorough understanding of what technology you already have, then it makes sense to go and look 
at the new solutions which might fit into that plan and might support it. You know, it's rather than saying, oh, I saw this really great email tool and we can afford it, so let's get it, without first thinking what part does email play in our marketing strategy or on the channel strategy. You have to have the strategy first. Right, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny that you say that about um, how many instances of a technology might already be in your company, right? The more, the bigger the company, the more likely, I mean, especially the CRM, right? I mean, how many, how many CRM platforms sneak into companies all over the place in the various groups, you know? Yes. So, yeah. And you, you get a big platform. It can do a number of different things. And some of them, you, you may already have other tools to do them. And yeah. I think it comes back to those few years we had of what they called shadow IT, where because mm -hmm. software as a service wasn't that expensive, business teams could just download it and try it without even telling the IT department. I think to some extent that's gone away because of security and compliance concerns, but that's where a lot of this stuff is left over from. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like, like you said, you can definitely look around, poke around the company, see who else has what, because sometimes tools do a thing that that department needs, but they also do these other three things that could be useful for your team. Yeah. So that's great advice. So, um, so let's go back and look at the drum roll. What's that top marketing <laughs> trend that um, marketers should be paying attention to and why is it so important? Well, I wonder if this is unexpected, what I'm going to say. I, I'm not going to say artificial intelligence. That might be the, the right answer, but how boring. Everyone, everyone talks about that all the time. I came up with something which might not be so obvious, and I will tie it back to the tech, but it's brand reputation and brand values. Those have become so inestimably important, especially over the last six months, but very much over the last three years, there's survey after survey, enormous amounts of data showing that customers are much more likely to spend with companies they feel share their values. And of course, especially with the social presence of, of brands, we have so much of a better sense of what their values are these days. If a brand has got sketchy values, it's not so easy to keep them out of the side. Yeah. That is, I think, hugely drive success for brands. How does it relate to tech? Well, I guess we can. We should, certainly should agree in this company that marketers own the brand image. But it's not just marketers, because PR people, if you like, your internal commu communications team, they're responsible for getting the message out there. They're responsible for dealing with crises, and there are plenty of PR crises around these days. And the, it interests me that there is this opportunity for marketing and communications to work more closely together. And I'll just give you one example. A very interesting partnership I saw a few months ago, Adobe integrated with Intrado. Now, Intrado, if you're not familiar with them, they're very much a communications tech vendor. They track your, your unpaid, your earned coverage. Uh, all kinds of metrics on that, how it's being shared, who's responding to it. But through this integration, Intrado's data appears within the Adobe Experience platform in a dashboard which can be used by marketing and communications. So you can track the effect and impact of your marketing campaigns against what's happening with your earned media and your other interactions and engagements with your customers. Customer experience isn't communications now, especially in the current climate, a central part of customer experience. And why don't we ever see it on those big slides which say customer experience, marketing, sales, customer support. Communications to support brand reputation should be in there as well. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. Um, you're right. Now more than ever, there's no hiding and people will call you out and if you're not prepared you know you just gonna throw out the word you need to be agile oh yeah <laughs> sorry i couldn't resist um you know to uh to respond and 
Yeah, and you're right. Marketing and PR need to really be in lockstep because you know marketers are giving the brand promise, and you know what happens out in the market doesn't always meet that brand promise, or maybe customers decide they have a different expectation, and so um, you know, so yeah, it's a challenge. Um, so we've got one more question um, going, taking us back to uh, the virtual events conversation. Um, that's on the other side, it's the, the non-tech side, right? So if, as we do, um, you know, as we look to the future in terms of, you know, a certain percent of virtual events will definitely stick around. Um, you know, do you see any technology developing that helps more facilitate the kind of networking that, that you get in person? You know, there seems to be a little bit of that now, but it's not really, it's fine, you know? Yeah, I think that is a real challenge which hasn't yet been fully addressed. Um, I've attended virtual events this year, of course, um, and I've seen kind of feedback from the attendants saying, yeah, the presentations were good. Yeah, we would like to be able to view it on demand. The Q&A was fine. But I didn't get any sense of networking or a relationship with the other attendees. And yeah, one solution is to have that kind of chat which is scrolling along, which everybody can join in with. But it still doesn't quite match up to being face to face with one or two people at a conference. There is something which I, I really should try, I haven't tried yet, but I know some of these platforms, I'm sure Zoom is one of them, has the ability to create kind of break off rooms so that mm -hmm. they can go off into a breakout room and talk about it. Maybe that's part of a solution. But I think you're right, it's uh, that informal, spontaneous, connection between attendees rather than just between the audience and the presenters is something which people are really going to have to solve. Yeah, yeah, I, I've noticed in the events that I've attended that unless the attendees know each other and it's a small group, the conversation, like you said, is always aimed at the speakers and not really have, you know, it, it's minimal unless someone asks a question in the chat and maybe you know other people answer. Um, but yeah, breakout rooms can definitely be helpful. So um, Kim, thank you so much for all the great information today. It was great catching up and great talking about the industry and trends and so terrific to have you here today. So thank you. Always good, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks for inviting me. And I want to thank everyone who's here um, for attending. Uh, just so you all know, DMCNY's midweek recharge will be taking the rest of the summer off. We're, we're off on holiday because we know you're, you're kind of going to be off on holiday. Maybe if you can go somewhere, you know, to your lake house, I don't know. Um, but another drum roll. We are going to be kicking off uh, our fall season on September 17th with our annual Data Privacy Summit. Um, so not only is the September 17th the Data Privacy Summit, but it's also my birthday, so I expect to see you there as a birthday present. No, just kidding. Well, but seriously, we do want to see you there because we are going to have a great conversation about you know an in-depth look really at the current and expected privacy regulations and what's going on that you need to know about. We'll be posting all of the details and opening registration um, by the end of the month on the website. So we oh, we're going to have uh, Microsoft, Axiom, Experian. We're going to have keynotes and breakout sessions. So I hope to see you all there. Thanks again for joining and have a great rest of your evening.